Are you tired of sculpting as if you've got sausages for fingers? Would you like to be the next big thing in art and sculpting? Then look no further than sculpting juice. That's right, sculpting juice. The magical formula that you apply to your tools that makes you a genius on the level of Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci. You heard correctly. All you need to do is apply a little of this to the tips of your tools and you'll be sculpting like the ultimate maestros of the great Italian Renaissance. Just listen to some of the feedback from our satisfied customers. Yeah, man, I, I, I try sculpting juice like only the first time. Like, I didn't even sculpt before, man. I put some on, like, the, the front of my, uh, like, it was just like a wooden carving tool, man. And, like, and I, mom, just leave me the fuck alone. I'm trying to do something, all right? Damn. So, I, I never used to be able to sculpt very well. And then I got some sculpting juice and I put it on my tools and Fuck me! I couldn't stop knocking out masterpieces! I, I play with the, the, the sculpting juice, you know. I put it on my fingers, on the, my, 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 my belly. I roll around in it and I try, you know, on, on the, on the tools and I create masterpiece. I sculpt a life-size, uh, city of Milano in my, 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 my house, yeah. And I accidentally got some spilled to my fingers and I went to the toilet and unfortunately I turned my penis into David. So uh, uh, I am going to ask for a refund. How do we do it? Why we dug up the rotting remains of great Renaissance sculptors like Bernini and managed to grind the bones into a paste that we now use with the spittle of Leonardo da Vinci's great-great-great-granddaughter. From this we create a special juice that turns you into a Renaissance genius. Don't believe our testimonials? Try it yourself for a week, and if you're not completely satisfied that you're sculpting better than Rodin, send it back to us for a small fee. The formula may be expensive at £75,000 an ounce, but there is no price you can put on priceless art. Now I just kind of remember where my notes... Oh, here we go. There they are. Mm-hmm. There we go. Got them. Got them. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I just thought of you, uh, because of your teaching experience in China, because uh, as you'll hear, the, 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 the interview today is uh, with George Shell. Uh, it's from a while back, but I just have not had time to get around to edit any of it, so... Um, I, I, well, I've worth the that. wait. Jordu, Jordu is, is, a, is a force of nature. He is. We just oozes sculpting ability all the time but it was really nice to sit down and just pick apart you know what goes on in the brain when that happens yeah oh he's probably forgotten more about sculpture than i'll ever even know yeah man uh, it's one of those things but it's such a the base thing i mean like um <laughs> when you you put the picture up of the things that you're sculpting on instagram like you totally should just body cast me it would have saved you a fortune because <laughs> <laughs> i realized that looks a lot like me but i'm not sure about the mangina halfway up the stomach but um <laughs> Yeah. Well, was, when that's finished, that's gonna that's gonna be a whole different thing. Oh, this is this is for um, a malpractice uh, lawsuit. Oh, I thought you were gonna, gonna sell them to Victoria's Secret or something for quite some time. And you know, I think I'll have the mold, and I may be able to change. It, but we're gonna be able to see all the way down to this guy's spine. Wow. Uh, when it's when the cast is finished, because we'll we're basically going to recreate the surgery mm-hmm. in court for a jury to see. And uh, is that are you printing more stuff for that in the background? I can hear the uh, the lulls book taken away. No, I'm actually printing a, a small um, bust armature, so I can do some little miniature stuff. I, I've been playing with uh, Monster Makers has a new. Uh, sculpy like clay. It's called Cos Clay. Mm-hmm. They've got one that is flexible when it's when it's baked, and another one's just. But it's it's gray. It's the same color as um, you know the epoxy coat gel coat that we used mm-hmm. on the ear molds, mm-hmm. and it's terrific stuff. So I'm gonna play around with some small busts. Nice of that stuff, and I'm printing a, an armature that I can cast in a resin that's gonna withstand the the heat I need to bake bake the clay in or I could just use it to, to sculpt monster clay stuff onto and and mold it nice trying to improve you know, I'm getting motivated listening to Jordu talk about sculptures like I, gosh I need to 
get better. I mean, there's always room for improvement. You know, one of the things that he talked about with you is, you know, being an artist, uh, the nature of what what it is, and you know, if you, if you're doing something because you think it's easy or a, a way to fame and fortune, mm-hmm. you know, it's definitely the wrong reason to be doing something. I think as artists, we we do what we do because we can't not do it. Mm-hmm. It's something that we were driven to do, and if you're doing it for any other reason than that, you need to rethink where your headspace is. Yeah, it's it's in that discovery, isn't it, of, of trying to do something when it's not easy. That's where you sort of find the joy when it starts working out. And sculpting is yeah, well, it's not say, it's, you know, it's not supposed to be process. easy. No, but it's, though it does get easier the more you do. It. You know, in military circles, they talk about you know the only easy day was yesterday, <laughs> and. Yeah, it's true. Well, nothing worth and it's worth true, having. You know, when is, we're working is, on deadlines and stuff. Yeah, nothing worth having is acquired easily, and it's. It, but that's a hard no. thing to sell nowadays because so many things, uh, you know, sort of um, sold on on their ease or convenience. And, and the truth is, oh yeah, then, and that you know. I blame that on social media. I mean, we've had the conversation in the past about um, that that raised some some ire with some people when we were appeared to be slamming the use of nose and scar wax for creating prosthetics. Yeah, that... Um, when that, that, when that wasn't good. actually the case. Yeah. But, you know, social media is, is loaded with sycophants, uh, people who are quick to say, oh, that's great, because they don't have any frame of reference uh, not being in the business, and they'll look at something that you and I would look at and go, ugh. Mm. I'm not going to show that to anybody. Yeah, it's and weird. Other that, people isn't it? see it and think it's just the the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yeah, because I think the the thing is, if you're in a bit of an echo chamber and you're just looking for a constant positive feed, you might get that from social media because most of the people who are going to be moved to type something will be your friends who want you to feel good. And there's nothing wrong with that sure. per se. But when you do do it professionally, you're surrounded by nothing but people that want to tell you a new one because they want to have a problem with what you've done. Um, and so you kind of get used to that a bit, and you kind of yeah, forget sure. that and, and, uh, you know, some people are just Because it's, it's all skin. text-based stuff, yeah. you know, it's, there is no sarcasm filter in social media, so... No, although I am incredibly gauging, sarcastic. Whether somebody's being serious or not mm-hmm. can be can be a little difficult to gauge if you're if you're not that savvy yeah well you know a hundred years ago there are a lot more worse problems i think you know i yeah. think i think we've 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 actually got a pretty good existence on the whole most of us and uh uh yeah it, it's easy to get swallowed up into thinking that um you know not getting enough likes or not getting what you think you're owed through social media is um you know the worst thing that's going to happen to you then you've got a pretty good life really <laughs> To be honest, yeah, no, it's, so it's enjoy things. What what other people think doesn't really matter. It's what you think, and you know, you and Jordu talked about people thinking that there's that their shit doesn't stink, mm. and you know that ain't true. It's <laughs> especially if you, you had know, that habanero no, sauce that I had. No, <laughs> no matter how good you get, there's always something you can do to improve it. Yeah. Um. You know, Jordy talked about that. You were talking about that. We talk about it all the time. Yeah, and do you remember that chat we had with uh, Don Lanning? You know, he was really all about that kind of thing. It's that constant seeking for improvement, and you know, you should. And that's well, that's what lets you know you're on the right track. Yeah, yeah. You know, the day comes that you look at your work and think, "Wow, I'm there. I can't improve what I've what I've done. There's no need to improve it because it's perfect." Yeah, you want to be around that. Well, yeah, it's. Blow the dust off that Burger King application, man. Time to time to do something else because you're not trying hard enough. Yeah. Well, and if we, it was easy, anybody could do it, and then there wouldn't be anything. So we talked really to, challenging or fun about it. Yeah. Well, we talked uh, a little bit about. Um, I asked him about teaching around the world because I know he travels a fair bit to teach in different places, and I wanted him to sort of compare his experiences. And I was thinking about how you were saying that you taught in China. You know, you had a lot of a, a very different. Um, attitude they have over there towards uh, teaching and learning. Yeah, it was it was delightfully eye opening. Um, teachers are looked upon in China the way people over here look at professional athletes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a it's a one eighty. Wow. 
it's you know we'd go out to dinner someplace and I'd be in get in a conversation with someone that I hadn't met yet obviously using translation apps of course because English is not a widely spoken language in in many parts of China and when they found out I was a teacher their whole attitude changed wow. toward me in the conversation it was quite startling mm-hmm. and I liked it <laughs> um, <laughs> this is kind my of my ego uh, liked it well there you go um so that was pretty cool. Um, I was saying about this uh, this headcast. I've been um, putting pictures up on Instagram this week. Uh, yeah, well, the last couple of days actually. Um, and you're sending it to Toronto. I'm sending it to Toronto. Well, this is a, a headcast that I did in my workshop, and I've got to send it to uh, Neil Morrill because Neil Morrill and I are doing this sort of team up of this makeup. But the idea is, what I've done is I've cast out a plaster from the silicon mold as a. I'm going to clean it up and master mold it here. Because it's yeah. a nice head, and I want to give Normsky this the head, a copy of his head. But um, it's just as well in, in case anything happens to the package on route, someone drops it or it gets crushed or something. Uh, we sure. still got the head here, uh, so yeah, I will clean it up. It's got to travel quite a ways. It's got to travel a ways, and I'll pack it up nice and hope for the best. But you never know. It's, at the end of the day, it's a you know a plaster banded shell. And, Are um, you going to do it out of epoxy? Uh, I I probably will actually, yeah. But um, yeah, so I'm going to send it to Neil Morrill. He's going to block out the sculpts and you know do the you know that that part of it and then ship it back which is he's another scary some, thing he's been doing some workshops with sean richards uh in chicago i think yeah yeah well this is what we're doing it for it's for the prosthetics event and it's uh a demo you know with sean and everything with uh with their brand and everything but um it's just nice because i have worked with neil for years and it's quite cool that you know i have to ship this thing back and forth across the planet to do it but it could be fun to do this nice little makeup, but it's um, it, it, it's something I can document and show, and it's been absolutely crushing me for three months on Dracula that I couldn't show anything because NDAs, and uh, yeah. you know, I just really like to do something and go, ooh, I just found this, or ooh, I screwed this up, or ooh, I think that looks quite cool, and I can just stick it up on Instagram, and for three months I couldn't do that, you know, so um, that was sad. So that's why I've been quite quiet for a while on Instagram. Oh, well, I'm I'm really pumped about our next tutorial for Prosthetics Magazine. Yeah, we did some good stuff on, on that on the corrected cores. I think this is going to be a going to be a good one. Yeah, I'm, I'm really really jazzed about it. That's awesome. Well, because we, we did uh, when I came over in, uh, into Colorado in August, and uh, we spent a couple of days together. I flew up and we just yeah we sculpted in some ears and we you molded them. I did most of the molding. You finished off the molds. And then you ran yeah. some foams. And then on my last day, I was staying in this hotel in Austin. On my last day, this package turned up from you of these foam ears. And you ran them. I got them here. They're on my bench right now. Um, <laughs> somewhere. Uh, here they are. Here's my the ears. The boys can use them for Halloween. Woo! There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I've got them right here. Um, and, yeah, and they're from the molds that we made together. And that's awesome. And um, it was nice to do that, you know, in a couple of days. And it's basically the I meat hope we in get the to do more of that of, uh, of, of the next article so yeah really really uh, was a lot of fun that was very cool so those of you listening if you want Stuart and me to come to your town and do a workshop hey that'd be fun we're, we would love to do it little battles of bits of rubber tour yeah it's very so. good um, I'm still working on this bloody website by the way it's actually my fault because I've, uh, I've the, the website is built but it's just the shop is waiting on some images now for the stuff because they want to put in the store because we can have a little merch store uh, so I've just got to get those photos done and then we can get that up and running all the podcasts and information has been uploaded every four, every one of the 44 episodes so far has been saved on cool. there so that just needs to be finalised so that's very very cool so that is happening so that's good um, and then yeah we're just just running great guns and loads of these podcast episodes which we need to record more of need to be edited up mm-hmm. but yeah things are happening it's just been quiet like I say because we've just been really really fucking busy it's been crazy but uh, yeah and it doesn't seem to be slowing down I'm I'm running running crazy right up until Christmas mm. that's good it's nice to be busy which is good yeah, yeah. it's nice nice to be busy uh and so it goes. Fantastic. Well, I guess we'll just get on with our interview then. So, uh, so here is uh, my chat with Jordu Shell. Oh, I wanted uh, to have you. Yeah, have have you had a chance to? Look, do you have a copy of his book? I've ordered it and I've downloaded it, but I haven't read it yet. But I've got it, and I'm going to ha- maybe have a check of it of um, this weekend because I bought a tablet. I can't a while believe ago. he's only charging tablet, five like bucks a, an, uh, Galaxy a volume thing. for it because um, it's so I can read that on there. Worth way more. It's so good. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, let me just say his uh, his book. I mean, he mentions the details on it, but you should uh, check out his Creature Design Handbook. The links are in the show notes, and uh, Jordy just mentioned it in the podcast, so it's well worth checking. It's like $5. It's $5. Yeah, it's no, great. it's it's crazy. You're foolish not to buy it. Yeah, so it's worth getting, definitely. Um, but yes, yeah, so so have a listen to the, the, uh, the podcast chat now with Jordu and uh, yeah we'll be back after after that woohoo so you've been sculpting for a while now yeah um since I was well I mean I, I don't know I've been playing with clay since I was very young uh four or five years old probably and uh I don't think I really started sculpting until I um started using um tools and getting more serious about it and realize there was some kind of career path. So. Mm-hmm. And you're over here at the moment because we had IMAT. So you've been working on IMAT. So yeah. yeah um, I was uh, doing sculpture at the Mold Life stand. Uh, great people over there. Uh, they treated me like, you know, one of the family. And, you know, I created a couple things for them. I guess they're going to mold them. That's what they do. Mold life. So their lives are made of molds. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I love coming to England. I love the people here. I love the food. And, um, you know, yeah, it's just been great. I've had a great time Fantastic. so far. How do you find sculpting in front of people? Because it's a kind of different thing. I find, for me, like when I'm doing maybe makeups, you know, when you're doing the application and stuff, then it ends up being you're doing with other people. The sculpting part can be quite cerebral. You lock yourself away from everything. But when you're doing those demos with everyone around you, how does that... Does that kind of like invade your mental space when you're sculpting or does it help or is it something you have not, to... Not necessarily. I mean, I, I uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of a natural ham, like natural show off. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't phase me either way. I, I've had a few demos where I was constantly being asked questions while doing it and it can, it can screw me up a little bit, but generally speaking, I kind of, I love the attention. I love creating things and having people be excited by what it is becoming and, and, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and other people's excitement kind of feeds mine and, you know, it's, it's just fun to, uh, I don't know. I like sculpting no matter what I'm doing, you know, whether it's in front of people, whether it's all alone, mm-hmm. um, you know, so yeah, it's just, it's just something I enjoy and, and it's fun to share that with other people. Awesome. So that funny little commercial we did about the whole sculpting juice thing was, in my head, it's kind of like one of those things where people just want to, you know, have an easy way to, to make something happen. And I've, I've heard it with things like photography or something. People all oh, get the right camera to take the pictures. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's got nothing to do with the tools, really. No, it do really doesn't. Great stuff. And it, I just, it, we could touch a little bit on, you know, how one gets better at sculpting. Because I, I have, my contention would be that the sculpting can be quite a slow process. So it's not an immediate feedback it's not really a spectator sport as such do you know what i mean when you're trying when you're starting out it's like learning anything um but it's what uh, i think it sustains you if you enjoy it you come back for more you you get better whereas if you don't get immediate feedback and there's a lot of things nowadays where people are just you know that they buy their way into immediate satisfaction or gratification well, yeah. and sculpting I mean, isn't that is it? i mean so, that's that's kind of one of the problems with um modern social media and all that people are ready to put out their shingle as as artists or makeup people or whatever long before they're really ready uh, mm-hmm. because they want to get famous and they want likes and they want you know uh, fame and to marry Johnny Depp or Scarlett Johansson you know it's just like ugh, you know but um you know I think one of the things that is funny about the idea of something like sculpting you know magic you can buy uh, somewhere on on a, a shelf somewhere. Uh, is that you know obviously such a you can't you can't buy talent you can't you can't do that um so ultimately it just comes down to that ten thousand hours that they say you have to put into anything you want to really be good at mm. um and i mean one of the one of the most insulting things that ever happened to me I had a student in America who he said he was really dissatisfied with my class, and I was genuinely curious. I said, "Well, Nick, what what was what was wrong with it?" And he said, "Well, I was just expecting more tricks and tips." And I said, "Look, man, uh, what I do is not based on tricks and tips. It's based on many, many, many years of work and practice, and 
and sweating and frustration and and that you know it's not um something like oh i've got i've got the secret in with the guy who sells you know sculpting juice and you just go downtown and get off the back of a truck uh you know so to me that that's really insulting when people assume that it it's you know it, it it's the arrow it's the indian not the arrow yeah you know um so you know i think that's something that's really really important for people to to learn and take stock of mm-hmm. when they're trying to get better if you really care about it enough it doesn't matter how long it's going to take you i i never thought about like geez how many years is it going to take me to be good i just had to be good mm. and i just did what i had to to keep improving and i was just obsessed with it mm. People that go into it thinking it's going to be easy or whatever, you know, it's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. So you're kind of driven because of the feeling it gave you and you did it. Mm-hmm. Can we talk a little bit maybe about, I don't know, if you ever get frustrated when you sculpt, if you can remember being frustrated when you were trying to sculpt. Oh, God, you yeah. to go. Oh, my God. So that must yeah. be the thing. Because the thing about sculpting, I think, is because it, it's such a slow process, or it can be when you're starting out, certainly. And you're very aware of every little bit of clay you're putting on. You're trying to be in the right place. You're trying to figure out the shape. Do you have like an idea in your head and like you're just hurry, hurrying to get to that point? Or is it a case of the clay or is, do you know what I mean? Is, well, is yeah, there... I mean, there, there, there is a little bit of both. There's some of that. I want to reach the goal of having this look right. But there's all, there are also happy accidents that happen in the clay where you just kind of go, oh, yeah, now that's a cool direction. And, you know, mm. and when I'm doing stuff for myself uh, or, or free forming design for something, um, you know that those happy accents are are a real blessing. You know they're great. And what about? I mean, when you are, have you ever when you sculpt something that's difficult? Do you just tear it all off and start again, or do you not? You just move it to that, or does it not? Well, there. I mean, there have been times when I've I've just punched the clay, you know, because I was frustrated that it just I just it was all wrong, you yeah, know, and I yeah. knew it was wrong. But one of the things. <clears throat> that I impart to my students often is that if you're looking at a piece of work and it just doesn't look right and you're frustrated and you want to punch it and you're angry that you can't get it right and you know something's wrong but you don't know what it is, that's actually the best thing to happen to you. If you're sculpting and everything looks great, you're not learning. If it doesn't look quite right, mm. that's when you're learning because you your eye can see that's not right. That means you're growing as an artist right there. It doesn't feel like it at the time though, but that's a really it doesn't, good point. But it, it, but you should be aware of that. Yeah. Well, the yeah. fact that you can see that something's not right yeah. means your eye is improving. Yeah. If you think what you're sculpting is a masterpiece, then, you know, <laughs> you're either delusional or very arrogant. Yeah. Or both. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I see stuff in everything I've done. I'm like, God, I wish I'd just mm, done that or mm, just done this or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and that, I think that's a good thing, you know, for you. I mean, when you, I mean, you design a lot of creatures and, and, and stuff. I'm, I'm not really a, a designer, so I'm curious for myself how ideas come like, oh, I guess you must have like been handed designs that other people have done and your job is to just render what's there. Mm-hmm. Is that a different thing for you than to come up? with something and that sounds like a stupid question but mm, not at all you... it's very different i mean because essentially you know i'm just a pair of hands with a knowledge of anatomy you know that is expected to render something i mean i got some designs for one of these predator alien and i mean they they were unbelievably amateurish i could i couldn't believe they were done in zbrush I just couldn't believe that this whoever had done this stuff was a professional, you know, and it was my job to kind of interpret this awful thing as the real thing. And uh, I was like, don't change it too much. People were like, don't, you know, the, the art director was like, don't change it too much. And it's like, I have to, if you want this thing to work on screen, I mm. have to. Mm. These legs look like spaghetti. There's no joint. There's no, you know, um... So I, I I fought them kind of mildly on it, and they finally realized, oh yeah, I guess you're right, you know. But um, 
when I'm when I'm getting the opportunity to design for myself, it's always a lot more fun. Mm. And then eventually, designs start getting narrowed down, and more and more and more people get involved. And then, and then before you know it, it's a piece of pablum and whatever. So yeah, yeah. the committee of people. Trying yeah, to I mean, it just unless you've got a really talented art director who really gets it, and a director who has a vision that is strong enough. Um, or, or, or smart enough, um, you know, it, it's usually going to be ground down to something pretty junk. Mm -hmm. You know, there have only been a few movies I can actually think of where a singular artist had the opportunity to design and create something without any restrictions. Um, you know, where the film almost was built around the the actual uh, uh, creature, uh, and and one of them is Alien, and the other is the Dark Crystal. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, uh, the Hensons actually approached Brian Froud. I'm not, I'm not sure if my facts are right, but I think this is the case. They came to Brian Froud and they said, "We want to build a movie around your stuff, around your look." I mean, which is an unbelievable opportunity. I'd be over the moon if someone came to me with that. Hmm. Um, and Alien, you know, Ridley Scott was, he inherited these artists from the failed uh, Jodorowsky Dune. And um, he saw Giger's work and said, that's, that's it. That's the alien. That's what I want. You know, that look, that phallic head and these ribs and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, it, it worked, excuse me, into the fabric of the film uh, very effectively, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's having that thing where people just trust the designers to get on with it, and they, everything is kind of micromanaged, and every every department, well, not every department, I guess, but certainly with the creature stuff, it does seem that everyone's got, a, a, you know, a, an opinion about it, and it's like just fuck off, just let the creature people do the creature. I mean, I guess there are boundaries you have to work within, but it does seem like it just kind of slows you down, you know. Well, you've got to fit your work within the context of the film and the tone of the film. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I admire so much about uh, Rob Bottin is that he's uh, managed to make his characters, for the most part, certainly in the 80s, uh, make his characters fit the tone of the script. You know, RoboCop feels like it belongs in that movie only. L you know, Darkness feels like it fits in Legend. The Explorers creatures feel like they fit in that film. You know, so I, I admire that, and I think that's a super important thing to, to be very aware of when you're designing for a film. It's got to fit the tone hmm. of the script. Um, but yeah. Yeah, because one of the things I think that happens now, it's funny you said about the ZBrush thing, it seems like there's a lot of people are in love with the medium of that because it gives them a lot of freedom, but that freedom is also a removal from practical considerations. So you end up with a lot of things that are very... It has a look about it, which isn't necessarily grounded in anything authentic. And, you know, it just seems to be... Uh, certainly for the early birds... I, I worry that people get will be satisfied with something that they can create easily and then stop because the, a lot of the practical difficulties, like an armature and the physical limitation of something, the fact they have to dry... There, there are certain things that ground real clay to your constant attention. Well, the, or, thing, the thing that I'm finding in ZBrush more than anything is that... I can't tell one artist from the other, you know, in clay, because it is a practical medium that involves physical application of your hands to a medium. I can tell the style of Norman Cabrera and Jerry Ar Joey Orozco and uh, Steve Wang and, you know, uh, all, all the, the various artists I know. Um, I can tell them all from one another. And in ZBrush... I'll be damned if I can tell who did what. It's, it all looks the same. It all has a homogenous look. And that, I think, comes from, you know, being removed from the actual physical process of sculpting. No one's style seems to come through unless they are very, very strong in terms of, of style, mm -hmm. you know. And even then, it's kind of difficult to tell. Yeah. I think it's good if people do use ZBrush to still use clay as well, you know, to kind of get to ground mm -hmm. yourself and that kind of thing. Just like pencils and paper, it's that, that immediate feedback is that haptic response because it's, mm -hmm. 
it's such a different thing when you're working the clay. One of the things I want to talk about is that psychological headspace, you know, that headspace you have when you sculpt. Like I say, it's quite a slow process. And for a lot of people who are listening to this who are starting out, uh, I know you've kind of addressed a lot of that with your ebook recently. You've just released an ebook mm-hmm. which people can buy, and I'll put links to that in the show notes for this episode. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that's about and where it came from and why you did it? I guess because you teach a lot, so you must get mm-hmm. the same questions all the time, or you just want to. Well, I think anyone who puts out their shingle with, with you know, uh, uh, who thinks they're smart enough to write a book is probably an arrogant asshole. And I, I, I think I'm pretty arrogant about what I do. I, I think I've got a... I'm a little... Uh, I don't know. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I, 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 I'm certainly confident about what I do. But one of the things I, I guess I'm frustrated with seeing are, is, you know, the paucity of good design out there. And, um, I mean, there's some that's incredible. And I, I, I do see kind of a... A coming back around to basics, which is really nice to see. You know, we're getting away from that kind of corny video game, overly busy look. Mm. Um, you know, I've seen some creatures recently on some things that I thought were pretty amazing. But I, I, I did it because um, I, I felt like I had something to say about it. And I don't feel like there's been a book that... Um, addresses it in a in a really straightforward way a way that can be uh, measured and weighed and broken down into you know one thing i think i am good at is breaking down my process i'm I'm, i think i'm good at um you know dissecting how i do what i do Mm. um so so i wanted to put a book out there that that showed people it's it's not rocket science you know the basics of of design and uh that that the only thing restricting anyone you know is the one thing you can't teach unfortunately which is imagination but to me you know you ask about the headspace i'm in when i'm trying to create my goal has always been to mimic the style of nature Okay, you're trying to make the most outlandish beings seem as if they're real. And obviously none of us can mimic nature to the to perfection because only nature is perfect, you know. But we can do a pretty reasonable facsimile. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's to me it's a matter of uh understanding nature's style nature actually does have a style almost like a, an artist you know um some people would call it god but you know there there there's there are areas of rest there's a balance there's uh areas of action and and uh you know certain similarities in anatomy and i'm i'm a believer in uh what's called parallel evolution which essentially means that creatures on other planets which of course exist when you think about the vastness of the universe the unthinkable immensity of it um you know i i believe that creatures will evolve higher creatures you know four leggeds two leggeds whatever will evolve on planets that are similar. They'll have a similar gravitational pull, so they'll be roughly the same size as Earth, maybe a little bigger, maybe a little smaller. They'll be roughly the same distance from a sun. They'll, uh, you know, I, I think I think hydrogen is the most common element in space or something. And, you know, that'll there'll have to be hydrogen and oxygen involved. Uh, so that there's some kind of watery... There's water, basically. Um, and it'll have to have some kind of uh, atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And from that... And I I, I mean, it's, it's patently absurd to think that this is the only planet like that in the entire universe. It's... When I hear people start to say, well, it's pretty rare. You don't know that. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, come on. We, we only recently saw a little hole... 
in the universe and realize it was bigger than we thought. Like we saw through some hole in the star field and like, oh no. You know, it's about three billion times bigger than we thought. Yes, of course, there's life out there. There's higher life. There's intelligent life. There are animals and weird things. And, you know, um, and, but, you know, there, there may also be creatures that, that are not carbon based and, you know, all kinds of things. So, mm-hmm. um, but because we have found a creature that was like nitrogen based or something creepy on Earth, some weird little micro worm. Very weird. But as far as the parallel evolution thing, I believe that animals will, on other planets, will be not horrendously dissimilar. They'll have four legs for balance. They'll have bifocal vision, two eyes. Um, they'll probably grow some kind of hair and, you know, at least de- depending on where on, you know, and if there's a tilt to the axis of the planet, they'll have seasons and blah, 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 blah. So, um, you know, I, I, I think it's it's... In more beyond likely, it's 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 a fact as far yeah. as I'm concerned. That so there's... similar conditions would render, you know, and, not I mean, too dissimilar I, outcomes. Really, that, that's my or... belief. I mean, but I am just some fucking dumbass artist. I don't know fuck all about anything, and there could be life on Jupiter for all we know. You know, they could. But I think I think what your point is that if there was something so outlandish and weird that it didn't have any basis or similarities, to what we've already know it wouldn't look right from a design point of view well so again have... i mean yeah i mean there, there's a there's a balance between rendering something that looks like nature and also making it kind of cool but i think nature is so cool i mean just look at the most basic animals like a dolphin or a meerkat or a you know a horse or you know they're all cool in their way, like a turtle. Everything is like, it feels so pretty and perfect somehow for its environment as if it were designed. Again, I'm, I'm not really a, I'm not a Bible thumper. I don't, I don't believe that there is an, a, a sentient creature doing all this, but there is a design to nature. Mm. There is. I mean, look at a leaf or anything, you mm. know. And, uh, you know, I, I, I feel that that needs to be reflected, at least to some extent, without getting too designy, hmm. it needs to be reflected in, in creature work as well. I think the thing is that it's, when you're looking at creatures and you're studying those things, because that's important, I think, to look at these things and really get your head around why these things look the way they do, because they've been beaten into shape because of the environment around them um, over, you know, generations and iterations to, to come to that evolution, yeah, millions evolution. of years. But it seems with the sculpting thing, I think a lot of people, especially when they start, they get very distracted with the process of sculpting. And I think the thing to do is to get sort of technically capable enough with the clay so you kind of stop thinking about it so you can focus on what it is you want it to look like, which means your head's got to be looking at environment and thinking about those kinds of things. And I'll, I think when I look about your a lot of your masks and stuff, you know, you may have like creaturey things. You go, well, you know, this is kind of, I can't think of any of the names of them. I know you've named a lot of them. But they, you know, get like faces with helmets and stuff, but they've got an expression and look about them. And you can sort of tell, even though it's not a real person, you you can tell that we're to have a response to them. That guy looks dopey or he looks kind of fearsome or, but it's a static mask. And that's that, well, that, that's because I guess you're thinking more about how to put that into the clay rather than how does clay work because you are so preoccupied with the mechanics of how clay works and whether the armatures work and all that kind of stuff. You haven't got any room left for the nuance of the character, which has got to come through that. And I guess that comes with experience. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the hardest balancing acts or one of the most delicate balancing acts is to create a creature... That looks like nature, and this is covered in my book again, uh, but has the human touch. Some element that gives it character, that makes it look singular and not like one of a mass of many things, you know. Even though, you know, it is in real life, it's difficult to tell one wildebeest from another wildebeest from that wildebeest. You know, they all kind of look the fucking same. (laughs) It's big crowds of them you know, crossing the plains or whatever. But um, you make a character much more memorable 
by infusing it with some form of character and humanity. Now, when you say humanity, I, I mean kind of like a a very subtle sense of character. I you know I don't think there's really much much an, another uh, synonym for it. it. It just yeah, it's hard to just put into words because the nuances are they they defy language. They don't. It's like when you look at real people. You know, you may, you may have a, a response to certain like the tube is a good example. There's loads of people and then, you know, it's like the lunge. No one talks to each other, you know, so you've got hundreds of faces and you can kind of get things that may or may not be correct, but you respond to certain faces, certain ways. This guy looks scary. This person looks attractive. This person looks mean or angry or whatever. And it could just be, you know, a curse of nature. Their forehead looks like that or whatever. Well, one of the funny things I, I do with my friend, I can imagine doing this with you because you're a, a character lover too and voices and such, you know, I'm driving down the street and we're all in the car or something going to lunch and we'll see a person walking. We'll be like, I'll make a voice for them. Like, I, I can't stand being outside. It's friggin' fucking hot out here. Fucking shit. You know, it's like this short, fat old guy with a cigar in his mouth and short cropped hair. And he's, you know, 68 years old. Ah, this fucking wetter. You know, he may not talk like that at all, but yeah. it's like I see him and I like immediately assess his character, and that's got to be the way he talks, right? Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, I, I I think that some of that some of some of my ability to do this kind of infusing character into the blah blah has has to do with the fact that I was an actor, you know, um, and you know b- before I became a caramel beach ball, I, I was I was a you know. I did a lot of television. I did a lot of stage in in um, Philadelphia, and and um, I've even da- dabbled a little bit in Los Angeles. But it, it's obviously I'm not seriously trying to be an actor there because that's every you know. If someone says I'm an actor, you say what restaurant you know. Um, so so it's like that that's useless. But I do still love character and I love acting, and I guess that's part of my hammy kind of. Hmm. personality you know but that's important i think because it means you're you're, you're seeing character and f- it's a feel thing and i think it's hard to feel that constantly throughout the night but if you have like a an idea that you catch in your head and again i think it defies words it's just you've got to try and render it quickly and get it out somehow so you can remember that thing mm-hmm. and then yeah. maybe you refine it and build on it and through that you know there's a certain when when i sculpt there's this sort of panic phase where i'm blocking stuff out and then once that sort of the the bulk of it's there, very rough and tool marky. The masses are there. Then it feels like a big pulse in my brain. There's RAM now free to think up more nuanced stuff. Yep. You know, I know and exactly what you're talking and about. And it's that kind of like breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down. That's again. a very good way of putting it. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, you you just you're, you're anxious to get that character right, and like, and once that primary form is established, which mostly you just do with your hands, mm-hmm. you kind of go, oh, okay. Now I can go into secondary form and really pull it out as much as I want to. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think all sculptors probably have it in common, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, speaking of, of sculptors in general, I mean, it, it really, when I, when I look at, uh, uh, on the internet and sculpting forums and, and like, I, I, I'm simply blown away. By how many fucking excellent creature guys there are now, you know Aris Colacantis, Simon Lee, Sebastian Lockman. I mean, it's just they're they're coming out of the woodwork now at, at increasing speeds, you know, um, and from all over the world. Mm-hmm. Have you seen the Sazen Lee guy? No. From China. Oh fucking Christ! It's just unbelievable. S a z e n Lee. And he does these insect and crab monsters that are just like... It, it looks like it was grown in a lab. It looks so goddamn real. Wow. Um, you know, I mean... So so I, I, I'm, I get very fired up when I see uh, all the artists that are, that are creating great stuff. Um, you know, that, that no one knew about maybe 10 years ago or something. Mm-hmm. Um... And and they're from all over the world, all over the world. Um, so yeah, I, I mean it's it's really an exciting time for fantasy art. 
Uh, and but at the same time, it's also a very saturated thing because um, you yeah. know so many people. You have to wade through a lot of junk to find mm. the really really good ones. Yeah. Um, but yeah, gosh darn it, there are so many, so many unbelievable artists. But yeah, it's still strangely difficult to do well. <laughs> you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. one of those things. Each one of those people have have found their voice they found their way of doing it but you've still got to do the work to do it and i think one of the worries i have is that people will see a lot of creaturey things and they'll 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 copy the shape of the creature without really you, you know oh, yeah. really understanding kind of like um i'm trying to think like the men in black you know the the vincent d'onofrio alien he's mm-hmm. trying to he's doing what he thinks a human being is right do you know what I mean? he's sort of doing a facsimile of a human being as but as a human you're looking at that's not a real person and it's kind of like a bit like that you don't want people to do the shape of sculpting without really grasping the nettle of what it is well yeah i mean there's yeah i know i've had a lot of copycat artists who are like that who who want to create things that they think you know capture the 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 vibe of of my work or or steve wang's work or somebody and and they're really just kind of aping the style without really understanding uh any any deeper truths mm. to that look mm-hmm. um and it comes out looking like exactly like you'd think like a a very you know weak half baked version mm. of of that artist yeah it's tricky isn't it it's kind of because it requires a certain level of appreciation in the viewer's eyes which is less and less the people producing the uh, films you know what i mean they just kind of um and uh, yeah, the, the burden is on you as a person who wants to sculpt and know what the state and really study their work and look and know what good work is. Well, but more, more importantly, and this is again, something I point out in the book is when you're copying another artist, you're filtering reality twice. You know, you're filtering it through that artist and that artist's work is an interpretation of the natural world. So you're filtering it twice and you need to go directly to the source, to nature, to really find your inspiration. Um, it's fine to be inspired by another artist or by a creation, but, um, you know, the slavish copy of a style is is going to result in something that can only be n- not quite as good as the, the original artist who is trying to mimic nature, which is the first artist and the most important artist and the artist that we are all trying to uh, stand eye to eye with, which, of course, is yeah. impossible. Yeah, going to go back to the source material because mm-hmm. that's where it's at. And when you're teaching, and obviously you've taught around the world, I mean, you must have taught in a lot of different places. Yeah, You teach a lot of the world. states. Obviously, you have your own studio, mm-hmm. but you teach in other places. You come over here and stuff. How does it... Have you noticed there are different attitudes in different countries like I don't know I was uh, when I was in Germany and I did um it was like a presentation and the guy before I went on said to me just so you know when you crack jokes and stuff they won't laugh it's not because they don't think it's funny it's just because culturally they don't want to interrupt mm-hmm. the flow because it's a respectful thing to whoever's speaking they just shut up and fucking listen which I'm glad he said that because I'm quite jokey when I'm nervous and it you know you wouldn't get anything back but because I knew that it was fine and it went great and I'm just wondering if there's a similar kind of thing like a, the vibe of a class can affect you as someone that's trying to get stuff across, whether you find it oh, different well, in different places. Absolutely or... it is. I mean, there are cultural... One thing I find, though, that generally speaking, um, people are more or less the same. I mean, yes, in Japan, they were much more um, reserved. You know, every morning they would all stand up when I would come in and they'd bow deeply, you know. Which is Western, we're not used to that. Oh, no, that, <laughs> but, 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 that, but I do understand that that's their culture. And, and, you know, it's nice and respectful. But, if, you know, I think it took them a while to realize that, like, it was okay to relax a little bit. Mm-hmm. But the Japanese, um, which were probably the most different culture I've dealt with, um, are, you know, they really do love silliness. They really do. Because it breaks away from that very strict discipline, I think that they're used to, in, in especially in school. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, the the French love to laugh. They love it. They immediately got my humor. Um, the Danish are a little different. They they 
laugh, but but they they're, they're very kind of um they're not excitable people. You know, when you when you show them something that you know normally gets a big response out of a class, they'll just kind of sit there and like, mm-hmm, okay. And then later, you'll find out, oh, they were so very impressed by what you did. And it's like, well, why didn't they say nothing? You know, it's like, that's poker because faces, they're, guys. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're just kind of like, mm-hmm, okay. Um, but, you know, the Brits are great. You know, they're easy to get along with for the most part. Um, you know, and uh, let's see, where else have I talked? Um, I did a little, th- a very brief demonstration in Italy, of all places, but the students, there were only a few actual Italian students. They, you know, they seem very nice. Uh, Australians and New Zealand people are pretty cool. Uh, the Brazilians got my sense of humor. I taught in Brazil and they were really, really, yeah, they yeah. love to laugh. And yeah. Mexico too, they, they're, you know, a raucous bunch. Um, so, you know, yeah, I have taught everywhere and, and uh, Canada, China, you know, but... Um, the more you travel, you know, the more you realize that despite some cultural differences, some being pretty big, um, people are generally all the same. They want to have a good time. Mm-hmm. They want to really, really learn for the most part. I mean, I've had a few students who were kind of not really, they didn't seem to care. <laughs> I'm like, what are you wasting your money yeah, for? Why are you, here? <laughs> you know, generally speaking, uh, you know. People want to have a good time and they want to, they want to learn. They mm. really, they really do. Mm. Cause it seems like a lot of stuff that's online now that kind of can create its own culture, which is, you know, cross cultural, cross different boundaries, but you end up with that, you know, that Instagram thing where there's again, that, that kind of desire to get likes and stuff without necessarily getting to the root of it. And it's not, that there's anything wrong with that. It's just, my worry is that, people kind of glaze over it because they want that kind of an initial like we said you know and then the the hard graft isn't an immediate feedback thing it does require that love of it which is a slow copy thing it's you know you need that slow burn and, and dig deep well i i think facebook and instagram culture if you will has led to a kind of softening a softening of artistic merit in that everyone is kind of fakely positive like oh my god it's amazing how did you do that dude bro you're awesome it's like and there's you look at the picture and it's this piece of shit and it's like you should go on face off that's yeah you're, you're, you're giving you're giving people this false sense of uh mastery that they haven't earned and they don't have you know um and a, i've seen some tremendously monstrous egos built from that yeah um, and, and I find it really irritating because yeah. you can see they haven't mastered the craft. All these dummies saying, you know, how great their work is, don't know shit. Um, and you know, if there's something extraordinary, I'm going to be the first person to go, oh my God, that's crazy good. You know, but I have nothing to say when the work is obviously mediocre and there's just... 150 likes and all these people saying how great it is. It's just, I don't know. I just, I, I, I think that it's doing a major disservice to the artist and to the craft. Mm. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I just have to be honest about that because it feels to me as if there is a false sense of achievement, mm. you know, and, and there's no way to really combat it. You can't really stop people from saying all this junk. But, you know, it, it is a disservice because it, it gives people this this sense of uh, entitlement, of respect, you know, that they haven't earned. Mm. You know. So it's a hard one. So I guess what do people do? Because I think the thing is people using fleeting opinions on things like Facebook as a barometer of skill. Exactly. And it's the wrong thing to do because it's not how you get better. You've got to... You got to look for those. Nick, it's like I guess it's like science. You got to you got to find ways for it to fail. So when all the failures don't happen, then you've got your you know you may have a hypothesis, but you you've got to fail a lot to come up with a conclusive argument, and and that's a lot of work with a lot of failures, and that's painful and expensive and, and tiring, and I think that's the thing. And if you're somebody that has done that, it it, it upsets you to see people not realizing that they're not. And I think one of the problems I think is with social media is that there's so much money to be made from advertising revenue 
someone can have a lot of followers and things that it's almost like that doesn't matter whether they're good or bad it's just whether or not lots of people like what they do you can know you're bought to a piece of wood and we get a lot of looks do you know what i mean if you're prepared to debase yourself in that way you can in theory you know but that's not going to get you further along well one of the yeah something that that um is interesting to realize though you know, for instance, I've gotten many, many likes on some stuff I've posted. You know, especially I've, I've been doing these uh, these heads of well-known Star Wars characters from the original trilogy for some time now. I've done a Harrison Ford, and I, I did a, a uh, Grand Moff Tarkin, and an Alec Guinness, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and I'm working on something else right now. The Obi-Wan was, like, hugely popular, okay? It got an insane number of shares thousands and thousands of likes you know and i've sold one to the client who originally bought it so all those likes and all that bullshit doesn't mean fuck all if you can't move your product as an artist Mm -hmm. you know so it's great to have your stuff shared because it means you're better known and yeah sure maybe other people will see it and I get contacted every day. I mean every single day about stuff I make. And I say, well, here's how much it costs. And they, pff, they're they gone. Mm-hmm. You know, because th- those heads aren't cheap. But uh, unless all those likes are somehow translating into sales, they don't mean anything. Mm-hmm. It gives you, a f- again, a false sense. And to be honest, there were things in that... Uh, Obi Wan had I I knew weren't right and I was dreading people I was dreading putting it up because I thought oh people are gonna say well that doesn't really look like him for some reason people just thought it was great you know I know it, there are things wrong with it mm-hmm. that I'm really disappointed I missed so you're not immune to that feeling as well I mean I think everyone that does it do you know it's nice to hear that you feel that same way too I'll still, what I'll, I'll scold something and after I'm done all I can see are the things that I needed to have done better. What yeah. kind of fucking asshole would I be if I thought everything I did was perfect? Oh, come on. There are things... Every piece I've ever done, every single one, there's, there are a series of flaws that I would fix. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, so, some are better than others. Some come closer to hitting the mark. You know? Um, but but every everything I've done has something to it where I'm like, if only I had dot, 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 hmm. you know? Um, and, and that's, I, I, that I'd much rather be that than, than sit on my laurels and think that I had created nothing but a big line of masterpieces that were perfect. And, yeah. Well, that's where the rot sets in, isn't it? When you stop, you know, checking for damp, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's not good. but, but I, I've heard that, you know, there is a feeling in, in people uh, who have accomplished various things that there is this feeling of fraudulence yes within them and and that 's absolutely true for me and i was I was driving to the comic convention in San Diego with a friend of mine named toy Oganyoku who 's a Nigerian artist who is absolutely astonishing i mean he does he does these models that he sculpts out of sculpey and styrene. And parts, and but but he doesn't use model parts. He makes everything, even little hoses with ribbing and everything. He makes it all, and it looks like it was a ZBrush print, but but with character and and weight, and you know, he's a genius. I mean, I, I think Toy is a genius. Well, we were talking, and and he said, "Man, you know." Jordu man, sometimes I feel like, you know, man, I'm just like like some everybody's gonna find out I'm I'm like not really that good. You know, as we were driving, I said, Toy, I feel the same way. He's like, What? You feel that way? And I was like, Absolutely. You know, and I, I said, Believe me, Toy, no one's ever going to discover you're not good. You're a fucking master at this shit. You you you, you are cemented into Greatness in the halls of greatness, as far as I'm concerned. Honestly, for any listeners who want to see this guy's work, his name is Toy T O I Ogun Yoku. Come on, I'll put the links in the chat. Yeah, but he did a sculpture, 
And I actually financed the molding of it because I said, I, I have to have a piece of this. I want the first one out of the mold. Um, and he was good to his word. You know, I paid for the mold and, and he gave me the first one. He just called it Astronaut. And it, it, it's a guy just sort of standing on like a little moon base, you know, textured, kind of punching something into like a wrist. You know, he's in a full space outfit, punching something into like a, a, a keyboard on his wrist. People are probably not... If I hadn't seen the original, I wouldn't believe that he sculpted it out of Sculpey and Styrene and made all the... I wouldn't have believed it. I would have said, no, 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 no. And the face he gave... It comes with a little... You can order the kit. It comes with this little face plate that fits on just perfectly, real close to the... I mean, it's perfectly engineered. We're actually collaborating on a piece right now where I sculpted the alien and he did all the hardware around it. But the face that he put on this guy, it's a young man. He made it so that you can't tell whether they are white, black, Asian, Native American, Eskimo. He like combined every... Uh, ethnicity into one face that is serene and beautiful. And I, the guy is a genius. There's, I mean, I, I can't say enough about his work. Mm-hmm. And there, you know, and he's one of these guys who is not aggressive. He's not posting every two seconds. Here's my latest thing. You know, he's really quiet and retiring and humble as shit. And. Uh, Man, I, I really respect him. I, I can't tell you guys how f- much fame this guy deserves. Wow. He's 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 crazy good, crazy good. He takes so much time with symmetry. I got to get off it. But anyway, he's awesome, and he's one of many many awesome artists I know. You know, from all over the world that come from everywhere. Yeah, I think it's important to like to, to... filthy roaches. <laughs> Well, it's good to find these people that do good stuff and understand where they're coming from and understand their work rather than just kind of like gloss over it and kind of think you've got a measure of what they do and then just hastily replicate it without really understanding why. I, I wish I could do what he does because, mm-hmm. I mean, he, when it comes to that hard, I mean, not not even just the hard surface, but just like skin and, you know, he's a master. But I, 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 I'm discovering so many artists these days that just knock me out. It just, you know, they're way better than I'll ever be. You know what I mean? And, and I mean, my wife and I visited uh, Florence, Italy a few years ago. And you think you're a sculptor until you go to fucking Florence or somewhere. And we saw the David and we saw the Bernini sculptures and Laquan and all these famous things. And I, I just came back feeling kind of inspired and deflated at the same time, mm-hmm. you know, because I can't render that well in fucking Sculpey, let alone marble, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but it still is a thrilling because there's still a journey ahead of you to to try to reach a level of excellence um, that that you haven't reached yet. Yeah, it is depressing because in a way the, the trouble is you see lifetimes of experience in you know you can see like a hundred sculptures and each one of those is like thousands of years worth of combined mm-hmm. effort but you can see it in an afternoon you know yeah. so it's, it's yeah, just yeah. it's like scrolling through facebook and just seeing everyone's you know that's true in. and, it's, 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 and it, it's kind of not real it's almost like you need to spend time with one or two which is why i think studying and talking to artists is important because you get to dig a bit deeper and mm-hmm. get to the bottom of where you were you mentioned earlier about amelia rowcroft i've seen her stuff she's very good on instagram <laughs> uh, one could say she's good yes <laughs> one could make that argument she you know I, i'm hoping to meet her uh tomorrow she worked for madame tussauds and i came upon her work some somewhere on facebook somewhere i, I think actually i might have discovered her on youtube she did a, a a sculpture of tom cruise that was incredible and she did one of the rock that was incredible and she did one of this and that and for some reason, the one that re- I was just like, how in hell did she do that? She did one of the actress Cameron Diaz. Do you know who that mm-hmm. is? The big, smiley, blonde chick. 
Mm-hmm. But from sculptural point of view, not an easy thing to lock onto. Well, she did her smiling, which is I, th- I think expressions are hard. It's hard to make them look natural. It looked more like her than she does. I mean, it was yeah. just ugh, it was a knockout, and I thought, you know, I'm doing a lot of these heads now, but I know I have so far to go, and I thought I have to meet this woman. I have to pick her brain and and how the hell does she do it and i know that she does things differently than me in the sense that she starts by just building up the profile and this was something i saw them doing in that italian school where i did a demo Mm -hmm. in the sculpture school there um they 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 build up the profile in clay first leaving it almost like like a flat a narrow plane for when you look at it from the front it's just like a a, a book thickness Mm -hmm. you know and then a narrow book. And then they gradually start building out the sides um, with very small pieces of clay. And I know I am way too impatient for that. Her results speak for themselves, though. So, you know, and I, I, when I see an artist that's so much better than I am at stuff, I don't hate them. I want to learn from them, you know, and I want to befriend them and and be in touch. And, you know, cause, I mean, there are... There's so many artists out there Mm -hmm. and there's so many unbelievable, brilliant people, Mm -hmm. you know, more than ever. I I really do think, Um, you know, I don't think it's just, it's not that the internet has made me aware of how many people it's that the internet has helped to breed so many people because everyone's starting to see what everyone else is doing. And in general, art is becoming largely better and better, I think. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, it looks like somebody sees something and goes, oh, I can do that. That's something I'm allowed to do, mm-hmm. you know, and then and then try it. But then <laughs> the experience of doing it is much more different than you think. You know, mm-hmm. so you've got to go through it and find your own personal, the things you're going to hate, the things that make you slip up. Because I'm very, when I sculpt, I'm very additive. I try and, I don't want to pack in too much. I'm quite small because I'm nervous. I'm terrified. I'm the same with makeup as well. I do very light thin washes because I'm scared of fucking it up. Hmm. And I'll see something in it, and it's very nuanced. But I'll, I have to do it very faintly first. And I'm always frightened to commit to something. Well, I think, I think that's, that's I think that's okay though in makeup because you're trying to it, it, creeping up on it is a smart idea. I think with makeup because if you build up on a silicone appliance or something too quickly, it becomes opaque and shitty, and it looks phony as yeah. a three dollar bill. And you're like, oof, what have I done? You yeah. Know? But with clay, you can just keep taking it away. You know, yeah. like oil paint. You, you know. You, <laughs> I, think, I think I think we've reached the bell curve. I think so. I think we'll pick up another time. Another podcast. Maybe I might come over to you. Absolutely. You're more than welcome to come by my studio and hang out. That'd be awesome. Let excited. me give a little uh, shout out about my book, which is only five USD. So yeah, it's only five bucks. You can go to my website, which is uh dot com. That's J O R D U S C H E L L dot com. And you can get the book um, in the uh, the store section. And it's like I said, it's only $5. You can pay through PayPal or credit card or whatever. And it's a PDF download. It's the first of what's probably going to be 10 separate parts, which are each only going to be 5 bucks a piece. But this one is has already 45 pages to it. And uh, I think it's more than worth $5. Uh, it's packed with information and photos and examples. And uh, the next section will be on mask sculpting and designing. So uh, I think that'll be cool. I'm excited about it. It's a fun thing to do. Absolutely. Fantastic. Jordi, thank you very much for your time, sir. You're more than welcome. I looked up a couple of the things he mentioned, like he mentioned uh, Sazen Lee and um, Toy... Well, Amelia, do you know, Amelia Rowcroft is also... And Amelia Rowcroft as well. And she's got an online... Master class, she does. That she yes, teaches. Yes, and it looks very, very the, good for, for doing likenesses. I, she's she's remarkable. Yes, I'm going to chat to her and see if she'd be interested in coming on the podcast. Actually, because I think she'd be that would be great to talk to. She's not a million miles away from me either, so uh, I should see if she's open to that because that'd be quite nice. But yes, yeah, so have a look at to that. But it's always worth because we always chat to people and they mention their influences. And this is the thing, you know, there are people that we really think are cool. And we chat to them and stuff. And then they mention all these other people that you've never heard of, you know, or I haven't heard of. Mm. And then it's lovely when you hear that. And that's why I like to put them in the show notes, because then you can chase up these people and have a look at Toy's work, have a look at Sazen's work. And it's yeah. just like, Jesus, these are amazing. And just so many good, good people, like he says. Um, well, there's a great. French sculptor who who uh, 
has several books out. Uh, Philippe Faroe. Yes, he's fantastic. Uh, he's also uh, incredible, and check check out his his stuff. Uh, he's got videos and and hardcover, hard copy books mm-hmm. uh, that will take your take your sculpt into a different level. Yeah, his stuff is. I mean, he does a lot of stuff in. He works in clay, but he also does marble stuff, which is not something yeah. you see many people do. Um, yeah. And and really not like the stuff that I would think is very difficult, like young children's faces, you know, smooth. You know, mm-hmm. they're not full of. Cra- he also does do that stuff, but he can do like you know, young like you know, ten year old girls with smooth skin and face, and they're just amazingly. Well, I've I've uh, watched him sculpt. change, ch- just with pushing a few things around, complete turn a child into a completely different child mm. with minimal effort. Mm-hmm. I mean, for, for me, it would be huge effort, but he just goes boom, 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 and it's a different, different uh, ethnicity or it's a different sex, and it's like, what did I just see? Yeah, how have you done that? It's like he's quantified, you know, the genetics of a face, you know, the, or the gender or the age of a face, and he just knows what to add and what to take away to to get that, you know, very efficiently mm-hmm. as well, which is <laughs> upsetting to watch sometimes. Um, yeah, there are um, there's. I went to was it 3D Total, and I ordered a couple of um, was it 3D Total? That was where I got got my my Z brush. I'm I'm trying to get back into Z brush lessons. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, let me hang on a second. Let me try to find this stuff. Where did I put it? I'm looking through my Dropbox folder real quick. It 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 it. it. We need some kind of like lift music in the background now. Yeah. Da, de, like, de, please hold de, the music. De, de. Okay. Um, Uldis Zarens, you know that name? He's um, Anatomy for Sculptors is the yes, uh, page that. on Instagram. And he's made available now Understanding the Human Figure and Anatomy of Facial Expressions. What's his name again? Um, Uldis Zarens. I hope that's how you pronounce it. U L D I S. Z A R I N S, uh, and it's Anatomy for Sculptors is the the Instagram page. Okay, and it's freaking amazing. I will. Put I've, link I've just bought just bought both of those books uh, online as as digital versions, and it's extraordinary. Amazing. The I will look that up. I think I've seen ads for that. I keep getting the same adverts you, you, pop yeah, up. You in have mind. probably seen it it's scrolling through. That and like the on, the on little Instagram. the little um, you know action mannequins you know for posing. Yes, that, those yes, two adverts keep coming and, up. I will look and that those up. Those are also worth having. Yeah, if you're if, uh, certainly for as an illustrator. I think you've got one. I remember seeing one on your bench. I have. It? I have the guy. I, I need to get the get the girl. Mm-hmm. But they've got a new edition out now that it has even more more hand gestures. Wow. And they're not big figures, aren't they? They're little, so it's quite amazing. No, they're the about maybe, maybe seven, seven inches tall. Mm-hmm. No, we said that was 12. If that, <laughs> if that, maybe maybe five inches tall. Yeah, they're really handy. Um, okay, well, what I will do is I'll put the links for that also in the show notes um, because that is definitely relevant and worth looking into. All right. Now, hey, I think one other thing. Have you, have you had a chance to check out the new... Uh, series of Dark Crystal on on Netflix. No, I have not. Uh, I've heard good oh things. I've heard good things. I know a lot of the people that worked on it because it. I binged the whole the whole first season in three days. Oh my gosh! No, I had. Uh, I've heard good things about it. I know a lot of the people here that worked on it. Pete Tindall and a few other people that we yeah, know worked and, on it. And, and here, you know, yeah. Sasha Camacho, uh, Van Dyke, and Miles Tevis, and yep, awesome. No, I have not yeah, seen that. It's it's. It's spectacular. Yeah, it sounds good because I love the original. You know, it was one of the big that and Labyrinth. You know, they were like the two, yeah. You know, big creature yeah. movies that came out in the time, just the right time to hit me as well. Now I tell you what I have been watching, which was good, not really bad, but similar. I watched The Boys. Have you seen that on Amazon? I think yes. Yeah. Love The Boys. I finished that in about three or four days. It was like oh, binge watch. That was good. Superhero yep. thing. I don't think the name, the title of it, and like the stills for it when you see the adverts do it any justice. It's such a good show. I really enjoyed it. It's well worth uh, checking out. Superheroes gone bad, basically. Yeah, the season the season finale was kind of a oh god. Yeah, like, 
Yeah, it was pretty terrifying. Uh, so I will yeah. uh, I'll look forward to seeing more of that, that's for sure. And Bloodline, just started Bloodline as well. I think that's on Netflix as well. But, uh, yeah. I started I started one called The Frankenstein Chronicles last night. Oh, uh, cool. Sean Bean. Sean Bean's in it. It's basically um, a take on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but it's using a lot of factual information from the field of medicine in the early 1800s in, in Great Britain mm-hmm. that... Um, that Lindsay Fitzharris writes about in her book, the the butchering art, and it's really cool to to see all the stuff. You know, having read about it and knowing what the history of you know body snatching and anat- the anatomists and the revisionists and all all this stuff is so cool. Mm, awesome. I have a funny feeling that Barry Gower did some stuff for that. Oh, the, the, yeah, there's some some crazy prosthetics in it. Yeah, I, I was there. We were doing Game of Thrones, but at the uh, time, there's a couple of bits together involved. children. Yes, I think that may be the body that we are. I've even helped on one of those bodies. I think. Yeah, that's from a couple of years. Well, then ago. you need to check. The, then you need to check this series out. I'll look at that. That and Chernobyl as well, which I know they did a bunch of stuff yeah. on. Which it's another yeah. thing I haven't seen. It's terrifying. There's so much good shit on now, and it's yeah. like there isn't enough hours in the day. Uh, it's not good. <laughs> no, and I'm I'm so easily distracted by by stuff like that. Well, it's nice and though if you've got like raising. Not a good combination. When, not a good combination when you're so busy. No, you wanna you wanna. <laughs> I, God, I really got to get this done, but I need to see another episode. Of yeah, or you know, you just need a, you know a cup of coffee, and maybe you're waiting for some gel coat to dry. And you just need an hour. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, um, but then you get sucked into it. It's a bad time. <laughs> Four episodes later. Awesome. Well, dude, I think we should probably wrap that up now. I've got to get up early um, to, uh, to 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 head off to Scotland. So um, we'll have a safe drive. I will, and I'll, I'll I'll be in touch when I get there anyway. Because like I said, one of the good things about going away is is quiet. You know, peace and quiet in the evening, so I can get on mm-hmm. and we can chat more, and I can carry on with this article and prep for some more podcasty stuff. So um, I, I will bring my recorder with me in case. Um, we we uh, you know hit upon some ideas and, and get some recording done. Great. Well, I'm I'm here all week, so awesome. Uh, we'll we'll talk this week. Yes, sir. All right, mate. Have a good day. Thanks. You too. Okay, mate. Good to speak to you. Bye. Likewise. <laughs>